time I'm just starting a new job and uh, I don't have my laptop with me. It started to die. Not really seriously, it needed a tune up. I took it in to get repaired and by the time I had to come out here it wasn't ready yet. Sorry for the close up, I'm driving. Uh, I record most of my videos on my, on my laptop. my wits about me and so it's a little awkward to use my my actual video camera but that's what I got to do I don't have a lot of time so I'm gonna film it as I drive also it's kind of an interesting drive oh man how many so as soon as that's gone, I should be all right? Yeah, after the first one, you're, you're good. All right, I'll pull up here, just like before. Thanks. <laughs> what that was all about is, uh, these roads are, are improvised. Look at this. And they're pretty narrow, and so when large when large trucks come on, there's really only room for one. So they have people stationed at the beginnings and the ends who uh, stop and start traffic. Uh, so they also keep an itinerary of who's here, and who's not here. Uh, so there's a there's an 18 wheeler coming apparently, which is common when they're setting up a rig. Now you wouldn't know it, but when I came here yesterday, that that Derek wasn't even up. Um, all that stuff comes in trucks. Um, basically, the, the limit on how big oil rigs can be on land is that they can be mobile. They don't build them to only drill one well, they build them to drill as many wells as possible. And that means they have to move, and so as big and heavy and industrial as they are, they come apart and can be moved even on fairly small roads. These are, they're not dirt, they gravel these, but, uh, or you know, put stones on them, but they're not very, you, you'll see on the way out. But anyway, I didn't just want to regale you with tales of my job. I wanted to do a book review. Uh, a couple videos ago, I went through several uh, books that I had recently acquired, and uh, Roman Skaski, one of my subscribers, uh, a an interesting guy too. If you haven't heard of him, he's a anarcho-capitalist, former army personnel person, similar to Adam Kokesh. Anyway. Uh, He's, he asked that I actually review the books uh, that I had uh, mentioned, assuming I've read them, and I said, hey, why the hell not? So I finished I finished a couple of them, but several of them were about China, Chinese history, not necessarily about libertarianism, or ones that I had suggested. Here comes the truck. Busy, 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 busy. No, it's the guy behind me is the guy in charge. The guy, the guy behind me is in charge. I don't know. Nah. That's a drill pipe. Use that to drill the well. Approximately six inches from my car. <laughs> Come on. All right, here I go.
So pardon the little interruption there, I just thought I'd record that. I'm glad it's not the winter, that would be a whole lot worse. It's not that bad right now. It's been raining quite a bit here today, the last couple days. It's finally getting a little bit sunny. Um, anyway, so the book I wanted to read, or uh, that, I, that I want to review here is called The Imperial Cruise. Uh, I don't remember the author. And uh, there's basically two sources right now that are kind of, that kind of gave me lots of book recommendations and that are is filling kind of my time. Uh, one of them is Gary North's latest lecture, or one of his more recent ones at the Mises Institute. Uh, he gave he gave one about uh, the Industrial Revolution and how quote unquote inconceivable it was. He used the term uh, ad nauseum really in the in the lecture. I like I really I really like Gary North, but. Um, it's a little bit redundant at times. And he, he recommended oh, many, many excellent books in that. And I've started reading one of them now. And I think I read another one earlier. But um, the other source is from a very long John Taylor Gatto interview with uh, several gentlemen who... Oh, the dogs. attacked by dogs. Hey, there's a stream. These valleys in West Virginia are all very narrow. They're V-shaped and so uh, there's not a lot of space at the bottom. There's usually a very narrow road and then a stream. And then that's it. And then rednecks with their dogs. Anyway, so <clears throat> John Taylor Gatto did this very long, very in-depth, very interesting, almost five hours long interview with these guys who uh, are basically kind of very conspiracy theory oriented types. And uh, they recommended, or they didn't recommend, just in the course of their discussion, they brought up many, many books and I ended up buying several of them. And this book was brought up and this book, again, the name of this book is The Imperial Cruise, which, they did not really discuss at length. They said it was very thought-provoking that it, it, it um, talked about a period in history that they did. That, uh, it was very revealing. Basically, that there was something of a of a an epiphany uh, in that book. And so uh, I thought, well, what the hell? I'll buy it. And then actually, somebody posted in the comments of my video that they had been forced to read it in um, a college uh, class political science, but I, I could be wrong, uh, and that they enjoyed it. So uh, I'm not sure exactly why I decided that one was going to be the one I was going to read next, uh, but it was a very quick read, but the first thing I noticed when I picked it up was that the author is this guy who wrote Flags of Our Fathers. Now I have not read Flags of Our Fathers, but I saw the movie, um, and actually it's a very good movie. Clint Eastwood is very interesting. And that he's kind of gone the gamut from when he was first acting. He was the, the John Wayne kind of only grittier, uh, you know, rah, 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 patriotic, violence, violence, violence. Uh, basically, totally pro-war propaganda. And then later in his life, um, and this started actually quite a while ago, uh, he always times it with the movie Unforgiven. He became much more retrospective and intellectual about his approach to violence. Um, Unforgiven is about, you know, the Wild West, so-called. Um, but he did a pair of movies about World War II, uh, Letters from Iwo Jima and Flags of Our Father. And, you know, both of them take a very uh, interesting kind of thought-provoking view about war. They're not just um, rah, rah, rah. Th Flags of Our Father uh, is about the Marines responsible, allegedly and actually responsible for raising the American flag atop Mount Suribachi uh, during the battle, not after the battle, but during the Battle of Iwo Jima. And it's an, um, it's the most iconic imagery of World War II, very likely the most iconic imagery of uh, the U.S. military in all of its history, the U.S. government also, and the 20th century and the World War II around the entire world. It's an iconic uh, image. There was both a still photograph and a uh, video recording I mean, that's not the correct term, but, uh, you know, moving picture recording of the event. At least one of the events, uh, you know, there's something where it was raised first and then staged later. Uh, I don't remember all the details. 
Anyway, uh, the author's father was one of the people involved, and uh, he wrote a book about it. Uh, basically, his father never spoke about it, and it's something that he basically didn't know anything about. He didn't realize that his father had become basically famous all over the United States because after that, that event, uh, the soldiers responsible, or at least the ones who were said to have been responsible, uh, went on a propaganda bond drive, the, I believe it was the eighth bond drive, um, to raise money for the war. And so, of course, they spent months traveling around the country, you know, going to war rallies and, you know, were portrayed as these heroes, so they became very famous. Um, however, his father was very jaded about the experience. Who knows why? I think the son himself couldn't actually say for sure other than you would think that somebody who was famous for being a quote-unquote a hero would you know, be open about it, and yet he seemed to have been, he would not even talk about it. And I remember hearing an interview with the, the author of this book saying um, that, you know, every 4th of July or VE Day or VJ Day, um, their phone would start ringing. It would be reporters who wanted to talk to his father, and his father, uh, he was always instructed just to say he's not home. And so he, he didn't even know what the big deal was until much later. He wrote the book, and the book is kind of an interest, inter, interesting uh, analysis of, of, you know, <laughs> of war propaganda, of, you know, of how soldiers are treated during war, how, how there's this kind of ethos that's created that's not necessarily true. You know, not, not a flagrantly pro-war uh, piece of work. Anyway, but I, I was a little bit concerned because I was like, well, this guy's not a historian. Uh, he was an author, I believe. That's how he conveyed, that's how, that's why he coped with his father's ordeal by um, writing about it and then having Clint Eastwood make a movie based on his writings. Uh, but, you know, I thought this is a popular author. You know, most of the stuff that they were recommending uh, in the Gatto interview is pretty esoteric. It's pretty obscure. It's stuff that, you know, if you're not quote-unquote in the know, you, you likely wouldn't know about. And this is a New York Times bestseller, and so I was a little bit skeptical. Now, uh, I still am. Uh, there are parts of this book, in, in many ways, this book is too general. Uh, and, and this isn't a critique of the book, I'm just, well, I guess it is. I'm not, I'm not downing the book. It was an interesting book, and for most people, I think, and, and I include myself here, it's worth reading, but it covers a lot of ground, and I mean, it's, it's the way I think I would write a book if I had to write a book that was about a topic, because I would be grasping at how to write, being able to write enough pages, and so there are all these, you know, paragraphs that just go into tangents, you know, okay, now I'm going to describe the, a brief history of the Philippines, and now I'm going to describe a brief history of Japan, now I'm going to describe a brief history of China, now I'm going to describe a brief, brief history of, uh, you know, political thought in the United States and of Republican politics at the turn of the century, and it goes into a biography of Teddy Roosevelt, and, uh, you know, all the, Howard Taft, and Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, and a little bit about his first wife, and uh, that is both a weakness and a strength. If you want a very, very rigorous understanding of history, this is not the kind of book. I mean, this is kind of a very broad brush book, although I have to say, and maybe this is accidental or, or what, this did actually mesh very well with uh, the previous reading I'd done, um, several books I'd read on the development of the Japanese Imperial Army, uh, what was the one? One was called Jib Shaman's Imperial Army. The other one was called... I forget what it was called, but it was called... It was by Akira Ir, Irie, who was actually quoted or uh, cited in this book. I was uh, not excited, but interested to see. But the Imperial Cruise is, is, uh, is about a cruise. The, t the titular event of the book is a diplomatic cruise uh, sent out by President Roosevelt headed up by, um, not, he was actually the Secretary of War at Taft at that point, um, I, th I think almost like 20 senator, or maybe eight or nine, 10 senators, and like 20 congressmen, and then also his uh, daughter, Alice, who was quite famous, something of a celebrity at the time, although the two of them really didn't get along very well. Um, 
The mission did went all over the Pacific. I went to Hawaii. I went to the Philippines that had just recently been acquired by the United States. I went to Hong Kong, uh, and it went to Japan uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, now, the purpose of this trip was something of a secret. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, and, and I've heard this, uh, Tom Woods has said this before, and I, I, I've heard it other places. I think Teddy Roosevelt would have been the worst president in American history as if he had had a modern Congress. Um, he, lots of things he wanted to do that were literally insane uh, were not done because uh, the Congress would just not allow it. And that's just not how things are anymore. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to do all kinds of things. He, he actually wanted war, and he wanted war for its own sake. It's not like, you know, some politician who thinks war is in the best interest of the United States or that we'll get an oil contract or, or something like that. It's he thinks war is good, that, that people need to have wars or else you know, they will wither away and fail as a society. Uh, and so, he was never in a position as president to actually uh, start a war. Uh, he fought in a war, but that was before he was president. Uh, uh, fortunately for history and for all of us, many of his crazy schemes never even, he never even attempted because he knew Congress would not allow it. Um, he was gearing up, he wanted to have a, a military alliance with the Japanese and the British, basically a triple alliance, and what's so iconoclastic about the book, I believe, although he never says it explicitly, is that Teddy Roosevelt was basically telling the Japanese to start an empire, and he was ex essentially describing exactly what they did and what they were planning to do and saying, that they should do that and that he agrees with that, that they should dominate Asia, that they should be the imperial power in Asia, in China, in Manchuria, probably in any number of other places, it, just with the, the boundaries being not British colonies and not Dutch colonies, you know, the, the, there they should be the imperial masters. Um, and this at the time, there was no way Congress was ever going to uh, approve of such a military alliance with Japan or a treaty or anything like that. Uh, and he knew that. And so he sent uh, Taft and all these people, uh, all these powerful senators and congressmen, to basically say, look, I'm with you guys, I agree with you, and, uh, you know, we're friends. The United States and Japan are friends. Uh, we're going to divide up the world together, us and the, the Europeans, especially the British. Uh, and he knew he couldn't actually get a treaty, so this was kind of like his second best, his, his run-up thing that he did instead. Uh, so that is interesting. And of course, there are all these interesting moments when, when Taft is in Japan and they're giving him bonsais, bonsai Taft, and then he would even go, Banzai the Japanese, Banzai the Japanese Imperial Army, ja <laughs> Banzai the Japanese Navy. This was ha this happened in 1905. It was after the fighting had mostly ended in the Russo-Japanese War, which I never heard it pointed out before, but this book points out, was up to that point the largest war in history. The largest battles in terms of number of combatants, assuming that Herodotus wasn't, or, you know, assuming Herodotus was wrong when he... <laughs> said that there were seven million Persians in the Persian invasion force. Even if there were a million, uh, then the Russo-Japanese war would be bigger. Uh, and then the battle in the sea, especially the battle of Tsutsima, Tsutsima Straits, pardon me, I'm very inarticulate at this moment, um, was the largest naval engagement up to that point. Uh, also, the war hadn't quite, there hadn't been a treaty yet, but both sides had stopped fighting and that it's during this time that Taft took this, this grand adventure. Um, so, 
you know, this, this book isn't going to give you a super clear understanding of the U.S. conquest of the Philippines or its role there or the Spanish-American War. It's not going to give you a super detailed history of China or Japan. Uh, but if you don't know that much already, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice kind of introduction to all those things. Um, you know, if, it's definitely the kind of thing that would make you, oh, okay, this is what I need to learn more about. The character, characterizations of these societies and their histories, as far as I can tell, you know, roughly accurate. So um, it's not like you get a, 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 a incorrect um, picture of how things were. You get a, a fairly decent one. Um, and the other takeaways from the book is just how nuts Teddy Roosevelt was, um, and how. You know, World War II, and this is what the author says, the author is coming from a very uh, World War II-centric kind of view of the world. Like, what? how are things relevant? It's based on how, how they relate to World War II. Uh, he goes out on a limb to basically say, look, I mean, this stuff that the U.S. government was doing probably played a very large part in leading to World War II. In fact, uh, the Japanese actually launched a surprise attack against Russian naval forces at Port Arthur um, before hostilities can, had really started. And Roosevelt actually congratulated them and said that's a good way to do it. Um, <laughs> for, unfortunately, he died before the irony of, of that um, platitude would become known to him. Hey, he died died about 21 years before Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, it's just too bad. It would have been nice to have <coughs> had him soul wretched just a little bit by that event. Oh well. Uh, what else? Well, the, the, then the other thing, and this is something that I thought of something as, as a weakness. He talks a great deal about a political philosophy. I don't know if it has an expl explicit name, but a racist imperialism that was quite popular in the United States at the time, uh, and was the, the the principle that got our imperialism going. You know, it's not, as far as I can tell, this isn't the motivation now, but the empire that's being justified now was born back then. Uh, basically, the idea is th is that of the white man's burden. That white men, and specifically Aryans, which I don't necessarily know if that necessarily meant blonde-haired, blue-eyed. It meant Teutonic Germans. Uh, you know, al although allegedly, you know, the idea being is that they originated in Iran or someplace in Central Asia, the Caucasus. You know, who knows? And that you know they spread out the world, but then unfortunately they they mongrelized, they intermixed with lesser peoples, Africans, uh, Central Asians, East Asians, Native Americans, whatever, and became uh, polluted in that way. However, fortunately for history, so the theory goes, some of them remain racially pure. Uh, those who lived in Northern Europe, especially Germany. Uh, at the time, at least according to the book, uh, the, the terminology was Teuton, they were Teutonic, the Teutonic Barbarians. A lot of this is based off of Tacitus. Tacitus was a Roman uh, writer who wrote about the Romans, or wrote about the Germans, and he wrote a lot of laudatory things that they believed in liberty and whatnot. I think it's interesting though, so these guys are like, well, the Romans, they're all these mongrels, but we're reading, you know, the mythology of the Teutons is based on Roman literature because there was no Teutonic literature and not would not be any Teutonic literature for many hundreds, perhaps even a thousand years uh, after Tacitus. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but is there, if, if, if the Teutons are so fucking amazing and, and superior, why is it that we have to read about them from Romans and Greeks? Uh, and this is something I, I see as interesting. Uh, today, most people who are who identify as Western or who, who value Western ideology, and that I would count myself among them. Oh shit! I accidentally zoomed in on my face. I don't want that to happen. Um, 
you know, we trace the ideological lineage of Western thought for now. I mean, yes, definitely through the UK, uh, through England, through Northern Europe and Holland. Uh, Holland people kind of forget, but that's really important. But then, if you, once you go back a few hundred years, uh, the, the roots definitely take a southern journey into the Mediterranean. Um, and there is definitely a Roman connection and a Greek connection, a Hellenistic connection, that are today considered more or less foundationally profound, that these are really important. And the Teutonic view that was popular in Roosevelt's day seems to very much negate that, that the Romans and the Greeks, well, they were they were happy mulattoes, you know, like they, the real superior people were the Germans, and maybe some of them interbred with some North Africans and you ended up with Greeks, and, uh, you know, lucky for the Greeks, but if they're so superior, why, you know, how come we're not talking about uh, fourth century BC Teutonic philosophy, because there wasn't such a thing, uh, basically. Um, anyway, this racist, imperialist ideology basically said, okay, so then these uh, Teutons spread out, and fortunately they spread to the United States, and, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis other peoples, the best thing is for the Teutons, uh, for the Teutons is to uh, annihilate other people so that they don't uh, mix their blood with the mud peoples. But if they don't do that, it is beneficial for the people they conquer to be assimilated by them. You know, other people, dark people, brown brothers, as Taft would say, little brown brothers, whether it be Native Americans or Africans or Filipinos or Chinese or Japanese, they would be better off if they were politically dominated by Teutons. Uh, there was a famous Harvard professor at the time who said only Teutons could actually run a state, which is silly. I wish it was true that only Teutons could run a state, but uh, it's a form of social development that most people racially are capable of doing, apparently, to the extent that states actually run. Uh, and this philosophy was used as a justification, as a justification for the um, manifest destiny, the conquest of the North American continent. Now, I don't think this is actually causal. I think the conquest of the American continent, if that's even an appropriate term, and at least in some instances it certainly is, uh, it would have happened whether or not people believed in the superiority of the Teutons or not. Um, I'm a bit sensitive about how the conquest of North America is, is, is categorized by people. Um, obviously, the government went around uh, mass killing Indians, putting them on reservations, making treaties with them that they would immediately break or uh, interpret in such a way as to be meaningless. On the other hand, a lot of the quote-unquote conquest was just people moving into an area, settling it, building farmsteads, building industry eventually, raising their family, and, you know, the, the society of Anglo-America was able to have a much higher carrying capacity than Native American. Even if we accept that there was a vastly greater population of Native Americans in 1491 than there were subsequently, there is no way the population of Native Americans was the way it is the, way it is the population now or even the population uh, in the 19th century. Uh, there's just no way. Uh, and I have a hard time describing that as conquest, you know. I mean, if lots of Chinese people moved here, opened their Chinese restaurants, have a lot of kids, and before you know it, the neighborhoods start looking Chinese. I just don't see how that's a conquest. Um, but whatever. But both, both elements happen in, the, in America. Well, anyway, so after the West was won, however so, you know, a lot of these people said, oh, look, we need to, uh, well, he doesn't talk about it, but I think what it was is basically just nationalism. A lot of Americans were looking around and saying, look, why, why are the British and the Germans and the French going around taking over the world? There's no reason we couldn't do it either. We're at least as strong as they were, and by 1900 we were actually quite a bit stronger, at least in terms of our potential military power. Uh, so why don't we get on this game? And then this philosophy, this racist philosophy, which is very, very politically incorrect, uh, just was a, a rationalization of it, but I think they would have picked a different rationalization had, had this one not been available. Uh, yeah, so 
it talks a lot about this political philosophy, which most people are unaware of. Uh, so, you know, people will be, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt's actually considered a fairly fairly popular president. I mean, his face is on Mount Rushmore, although the guy who built Mount Rushmore was his fifth cousin and married to his second cousin, or second first cousin once removed. Oh, and I guess I should mention that briefly. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, FDR's wife, and her maiden name was Roosevelt, apparently, uh, <laughs> was first cousins with, uh, with Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, Alice. Um, actually, probably all of his kids. Teddy Roosevelt had two wives. He had one who had one daughter named Alice, and then she died. He remarried and had about four or five sons. And whenever you heard about, like, Kermit Roosevelt, all those people, that those are his sons by his second wife. Uh, so they, she was first cousins with Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, which would mean probably that either Teddy or his wife, first wife anyway, were siblings with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's parents or something like that. Uh, and then FDR was Teddy Roosevelt's fifth cousin, which to me isn't all that particularly related, although they happen to have the same surname. Which is, by the way, how uh, FDR got his start in, po start in politics. He was wealthy, and he had the right name. Roosevelt was a popular name. Anyway, he's super popular. He's on Mount Rushmore. You know, he's one of those people who kind of, when they rate presidents, he's not rated at the top with Lincoln or, or FDR or Washington, but he's usually, oh, a second tier. And I always, a lot of conservatives really like him because he was, I mean, he just loved war. He loved to fight. He kind of sort of practiced what he preached, but it was a lot of choreography with that. I mean, he he would dress up uh, for war. He would dress up to be a cowboy. He actually sort of did it, but it was more, this is a photo opportunity than an actual lifestyle that he embraced. Uh, at least that's, that's certainly the case with uh, his cowboy days. Uh, his He was actually, I mean, he did actually go and fight the Spanish in Cuba. I don't know how much actual danger he was in. I, I don't have any reason to think he was a coward or anything. Uh, but, you know, how, how how terribly risky was that for him, I don't know. I mean, the Spanish nominally fought back, at least sometimes, so maybe maybe he was really heroic. But it's not heroic when you're not, I mean, it's not self-defense. He's being a, you know, they, make, they mention this in the book. You know, the justification was, for the war was the abuse of Cuba, and all these pu these brave Cubans are being hurt by the, the by the Spanish overlords. You know, and then all they get there, and they're like, "Oh, these Cubans are black. Oh, what are these lazy niggers?" Like that's exactly. I mean, pardon my French, but that's exactly what they said. You know, and then they're like, "Well, well, it was before they were brave and you know whatever. Now it's like, oh, well, these people are so stupid that we need to take over Cuba." And the same thing happened in the Philippines. Oh, you know, these the brave Filipinos fighting for their freedom, and then we come and take a look at them, and we're like, oh, no, you're, you know, you can't run your own country. We need to do it for you. Blatant hypocrisy, nothing new. It's just the hypocrisy is ra is racially motivated in this case, or at least ostensibly. That's the only kind of real change. Uh, we still do this in other countries. It's just, you know, we don't say it's because you're ethnically non-white, so you can't handle it. We just say you don't have enough democracy. That's the whole... Yeah, instead of the... <laughs> it just shows that the excuse for empire is always just going to be tailored to what's necessary, you know? So back then, when people were racist, you had a racist excuse. Oh, you know, they're just too stupid. Their, their race ideology doesn't allow them. You know, now people are all about democracy, so now what they just say is, oh, we're just, we're just making the world safe for democracy. Like, that's Saddam Hussein. The, ultimately, it wasn't that he killed people. Killing people is fine as long as you have a mandate from, not heaven, but from the electorate. It's that he wasn't democratic enough. You know, he just wasn't democratic enough. And and we need to give democracy. So, you know, all this mass homicide, which is even worse now than it was in the Philippines, uh, is okay because it's for democracy. Just like it was okay because of the Teutonic prerogatives to rule the world. You know, ideology that... You know, it's just kind of like Hitler was only bad and that he was behind the curve, you know, like all this racist 
we got to get ready. We got to have this Lebensraum. We got to have a, a hegemonic, autocratic state that can control itself. That's exactly what everyone in America believes and believed. They just realized, well, you don't justify that by racism. You justify that by democracy, bitch. Jeez, get with the program. That's the only real difference. And that is kind of the lesson. And that is the ultimate revisionism of, of World War II or war generally is to not, is to realize that you're not the good guy, that it's not good guys versus bad guys, that it's bad guys versus bad guys, and that the whole thing is bad, and that the whole thing should never happen, that it should be opposed. And that the people who promote it and who popularize it, they should be viewed as pariahs, as a, as a plague on society, not, not a law, not something laudatory, not something heroic. Not something that we all have to be thankful for. Not even, the, and of course, a lot of people take it to the point is that's the main point of society is to have war, like the high, the high point of society. And I know when I was a little kid, I kind of thought this way. You know, what did I think was the coolest thing was war, because I didn't know anything about it, because I was an idiot, because I believed in plain war, because I believed in the the propaganda version of war. And I'm not saying that oh, all war is all hell all the time. No, but it's unbelievably stupid and wasteful even when it's not hell. You know, even when nobody dies, they're wasting money and time and resources. And then when people do die, well, it's a fucking tragedy because they're not buying anything good from it. It's not like someone who dies building a bridge or something like that. It's someone who dies destroying stuff. And then popularizing the very process that's impoverishing everybody. And so in that sense, this book is good for that. Now, this isn't World War II revisionism. It's just, look how racist the U.S. government is. Look how imperialistic it is. And look how its policies in this regard uh, came back to haunt it a couple years down the road. Just a few years down the road in this case. So, uh, it is a good book. If you want to if, if you want to get a general history about this time period, about the, the it doesn't talk anything really about Europe. So, you know, it, it's useful if you want to learn about Oh, Korea, Japan, China, a little bit, and the United States, and they're all together, and also about this Teutonic racist ideology, and, and it's nice to see how, or not nice, but it's it's important to see how not dissimilar this is from the much more infamous racist ideologies of just a few years later. You know, uh, the infamy that Hitler has should be shared among many others, including many popular Americans, so that's pretty much it. All right. I'm gonna cut it because I'm rambling at this point.